Hello, everyone. I am Michael Lardner from the Marxist Education Project, and I'm very happy that we're able to host this event today. And I was there is a a, a circular aspect to this in that when we began the Marxist Education Project back in the summer of 2014, there was a person who came to our first summer school who I met, who had just come to the United States, and that is Anya Bree, who is with us today. And she is part of ECR and is going to be moderating today's event. And it, it, it feels um, incredibly good to see Anya still engaged in, in uh, I, as I will say, broad anti-capitalist activity. And uh, I am just going to make a few announcements of upcoming events so that you, um, you don't have to go to sleep so early into today's presentation. Uh, uh, next weekend, May 7th and 8th, on May 7th, we have a talk with John Bellamy Foster and Marcello Musto to, um, that is from the Marx Revival book, which is this uh, new anthology of writings uh, on various topics. John Bellamy Foster is speaking on oncology, uh, on uh, ecology and uh, Marxism, whereas uh, Marcello Musto is going to speak to communism. Uh, the day after that, uh, May 8th, is uh, um, uh, uh, um, the, we have, geez, I have too many events going on. But on on um, on uh, May eighth is a uh, Jane Holgate. I'm sorry, uh, this is a rescheduled event. Jane was on strike when she was first scheduled and was barricaded in a basement at a university over in the UK and couldn't get to the event. So we have a rescheduled event on a rise, and it is on her new book on the the new. Uh, of militancy in the labor movement, not just in the U.S. and U.K., but what is being observed all over the world. Uh, the weekend after that, on uh, May 14th, Don Milligan, who some of you in the U.K. may know, he's very active in the LGBTQ community. He has written a book on the embrace of capital, and why is it that workers hate most of what happens under capitalism, but still embrace the consumerist culture that is there? And uh, he's speaking to this dichotomy, and it should be a very interesting event. That is on May 14th. So far, all three events are at 2 in the afternoon. The day after, on May 15th, we have a presentation with a large panel including Adolf Reed and Toure Reed, Sam Gendon, um, Hilary Wainwright, <laughs> along with Vishwas Sakur, who are talking about a, a whole range of issues that have led to polarization throughout the, the movements globally. Uh, Sam will be speaking particularly to the decline of militancy in the U.S. labor movement. Uh, you'll, you can see it all on our website. I'm already talking more than I want to about future events because you're here for today. Uh, I'm giving the Zoom room floor over to Anya now. Take it away, Anya. Thank you so much, Michael. And hello and welcome, everyone. As Michael, I think, Michael, you mentioned, I'm uh, a member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava who has co-sponsored this event. Uh, we are a nationwide US-based um, coalition network uh, that does solidarity uh, work with the people of Rojava in Northeast Syria and the Kurdish movement um, more broadly. And we, are very great, uh, we are very grateful to Marxist Education Project for arranging this event. We're also extremely great, grateful to everyone who has decided to join us today and spend this May Day with us. Uh, I'm sure you had a lot of other options, including marching on the streets, and perhaps, perhaps some of you already did that. Um, and um, 
I would also like to send uh, our greetings and solidarity to our comrades in Rojava who are also celebrating the International Workers' Day today. So before I introduce our two speakers, um, let me just say a few words about the framework of this event. So it's uh, the International Workers' Day today, but we are not going to be focusing on the workers' struggle in Rojava per se. Rather, we will talk about the communal struggle um, of the peoples of Rojava as part of the revolution that began uh, with the outbreak of the Arab Spring in Syria, but has lo much longer roots uh, in the Kurdish liberation movement uh, that emerged in Turkey. We will be looking in particular at uh, Rojava's ongoing efforts to build a cooperative economy as well as the women's role in this new economy and the women's role in the revolution at large. So our focus uh, departs uh, from the traditional spotlight of this uh, day because the Rojava revolution has um, expanded and has rethought the notion of the revolutionary subject. So the current, um, Kurdish, the current Kurdish liberation movement emerged in Turkey, as I mentioned in the 1970s, as a Marxist-Leninist Marxist-Leninist national liberation um, armed struggle with the formation of the Kurdistan Workers' Party. However, in the 1990s, they transformed their uh, vision of the struggle and uh, formulated a new philosophy called uh, democratic confederalism. This philosophy combines such elements as direct democracy, social ecology, women's emancipation, cooperative economy, and ethnic and religious pluralism. Among other thinkers, um, this philosophy has been, was greatly influenced by Murray Bookchin, whose daughter Debbie is here with us today, great honor. Um, so in this new vision that the Kurdish movement uh, formulated, the revolutionary subject was the community as a whole, right? The community aims to democratize politics through building local communes, and it attempts to abolish capitalism by building locally rooted and ecologically sustainable cooperative economy. Moreover, women are seen as uh, playing a central role in any revolutionary struggle. They are identified as the most oppressed uh, group in the society and uh, recognized to have the greatest uh, revolutionary potential, which echoes the um, vision of and the understanding of uh, black radical feminists. So our focus today is cooperative economy and women's struggle in Rojava. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers. We have today with us Emre Shahin, who is a participant and researcher of social movements, particularly the Kurdish movement, and a sociologist at Binghamton University in New York. And we also have an honor to have with us Megan Bodet, who is director of research at the Kurdish Peace Institute. Both Emre and Megan have traveled to Rojava and have written and spoken extensively about the struggle there. So Emre will start us off with his presentation on Rojava's cooperative economy. The floor is yours, Emre. Thank you, Anya and Michael for putting to get, uh, today together and thanks everyone for uh, joining today's talk during a busy Bay day. May they happy International Workers Day to everyone and I'd like to begin with a brief apology. I am on the road and I had to uh, take this uh, conference meeting at a cafe five, six hours away from home. Sometimes if you hear noises in the background, uh, apologies in advance. I'll try. I hope it will be minimal. Now I will share my screen for a somewhat brief presentation on the collective economy and women's economy in Rojava. Uh, I guess uh, let's begin with a quick geographical contextualization. Many of you uh, probably uh, know this, but for those who may not, this is the uh, region we'll be talking about today mostly. And the areas marked here in yellow uh, are where the uh, Rojava Northeast Syria are located. These are some major towns uh, pointed across the Turkey-Syrian border. So uh, on the map, here's Rojava and a brief historical and political context of the region. Uh, 
Persia and North East Syria was under Ottoman rule for a little more than three centuries, up until the, the early 20th century. During the after the First World War, it became a French mandate, and after the Second World War, uh, it came into independence from France. And the Baathists, as soon as Baathists came to power in the late 60s, they started implementing a Green Belt, uh, Arab Belt project, which basically uh, Arabized the Kurdish northern part of Syria, uh, forced migration, uh, the, re the, re the cancellation of citizenship of hundreds of thousands of Kurds in Syria. And then uh, at the turn of the century, we have the arrival of Abdullah Öcalan in Rojava and Damascus uh, after the uh, actually, sorry, after the 1980 coup, we have the arrival uh, until 1999, until Ojalan's capture. Uh, during these 20 years, there's a uh, popular uh, organization of the peoples there, not only the Kurds, but uh, other Arab locals as well. Some important events in recent history is Kamishna uprising, the uh, under. Up, under Ground mobilization of Kurds and other peoples, you know, by the PKK during the 80s, 90s. Uh, somewhat, uh, yeah. After two decades of that, we have Kamushka uprising in 2004, where uh, state forces attack Kurdish fans in a politically motivated soccer fight, and dozens of people get killed, and tensions rise. And tensions rise again in 2010, 11, with the beginning of the Syrian civil war, which, you know. Uh, shifted the geopolitics uh, and the, you know, and the status quo, political status quo in the region. Uh, we could say the past 10 years have been marked by war mobilization and embargo on the ground, uh, and the regional restructuring is ongoing as the war hasn't reached a final uh, end conclusion. This is a photo I wanted to share from the stadium where the 2004 Kamishle uprising took place and dozens of civilians were killed. In this stadium, which was under, you know, Assad control until recently, there used to be a writing, one nation, one flag, one country, one peoples, just like Turkey and Iraq and all the other occupying states of Kurdistan employed. And with pictures of Bashir and uh, Assad al-Assad, you know, father and son, but after the revolution, we have the same stadium uh, with the writings Syria Democrat Kurdistan Kafwasar. So Democratic Syria, Autonomous Kurdistan with uh, YPG, YPJ, Ujalan, and Syria. After this introduction, uh, I'll talk about the economic mobilization on the ground. Uh, uh, there is a, we can say that there's a tier tiered economy. Uh, uh, there, there's the you know private sector uh, as as it exists in, in, in most other parts of the world with uh, private capital holders, shops, uh, companies. There's the public se sector, which is you know an autonomous administration uh, regulated very much. You know, autonomous administration like companies doing the mostly agricultural products and oil sales. And there's the collective se sector. And in this presentation, I'll focus a little more on the collective cooperative aspect of it, and which is also the uh, subject of my dissertation research and ongoing uh, work. And to begin with, the collective sector does not make up the majority of the economy. From many people I spoke to in places that I went to on the ground, people give an estimate of 1 to 2 percent of the entire economy maybe being uh, sustainable in the collective uh, economy. Uh, because of the war and embargo, these models have not really expanded yet. But regarding the collective economic sort of limits, uh, I can say cooperatives make up the backbone and the cooperatives range, the majority of the co cooperatives are agricultural, uh, predominantly wheat and barley or mixed, but with husbandry, different animal cooperatives, generators, bakery, canned food, garments, 
cushion, shampoo, even way bridge to way cars in between, you know, doing their travels in between towns. Restaurant cooperatives, water bottling facility, property leave, you know, anything in around vehicle repair and you know, different individual shop cooperatives. Uh, Although the number fluctuates over time, around 200, 250 cooperatives exist on the ground. Their sizes may vary, you know, with memberships of, you know, as low as 15, 20 to as high as uh, several hundreds. Uh, yeah. And there are the communes. I guess the way I would differentiate mainly between cooperatives and communes is that uh, in terms of economical activity, they they both partake in it, but communes, people usually reside in a physical space where cooperatives, not always, but most often, bring people together who reside their individual homes and you know, come to the cooperative state, area, may it be the field, may it be the shop, to you know, run and maintain the cooperative. There's communes, people live in there, and there are communes ranging from communist communes, environmentalists, and, you know, communist socialists uh, and in you know, different village and neighborhood communes. Yeah. <clears throat> I was in Warsaw for two months in summer of 2019 and visited the, again the thousands for the back end. Uh, I was able to visit these 14 towns along the border I showed a few beginning of the presentation. In, in all of these towns I went to the Abori offices. Abori are sort of like the equivalent of Ministry of Economy. And like all other organ types of organization in Rojava, every unit, every political, economical office unit organization has its sort of women's only version, aborigine, made up of women who are also part of the general mixed gender abori. Uh, so women are autonomously organized in every aspect of area they are organized in, you know, uh, in general. So there were uh, co cooperative coordination centers in each town uh, that I was able to visit. And similarly for women's co-op coordination centers, there were the co-ops themselves that I visited and women's co-ops and then, you know, communes where people reside in women's commune, you know, mainly Jimba. And through 14 interviews in different languages with, you know, talking to the members and uh, co-administrators of these different places and uh, I was able to uh, have some idea. I'm going to share some uh, photos from the ground now before I finalize with the concluding slide of my portion. I hope I'm not doing too bad on the time. Am I doing bad on the time? Sorry. Okay. Presentation. Uh, this is the Cooperative Coordination Center in Kamishlu. This is the mixed gender uh, center. And uh, every town, like I said, has these such cooperative centers. They are affiliated with the autonomous administration, but they do not have this centralist relation with the co-ops. That in a way, they don't go out seeking to recruit people to form co-ops and you know, driving uh, this wave, they're more uh, sort of like a assisting position where uh, people that want to form co-ops uh, usually go, and sometimes they have meetings with different communities too, but their main role is to help with coordination of all the co-ops in a particular region. Uh, all these cooperatives give 5% of their annual uh, uh, income as a sort of solidarity fund uh, to the cooperative center, which then uses uh, in the establishment or, or like supporting of other emerging cooperatives. Uh, in Kamishlu, for example, in, in and around Kamishlu, we were talking about a total of 18, 590 cooperatives at the time. Uh, this is a uh, generator cooperative from close to Kamishlu. I like this picture because it shows how cooperatives are not, uh, are not spaces that just 
uh, like come inorganically to the contrary, the, the, their emergence is very uh, organic and sort of connected with other aspect of the revolution that's taking place. As you know, there are more than 4,000 assemblies at different levels, you know, from the street, district, regional to all across Rajava. Uh, and this cooperative, for example, was formed, Cooperative Rojava, this specific generative cooperative, was formed within the commune of uh, Shahid Berges, Martyr Berges commune. So that neighborhood near Famishlu as a commune, like a local assembly commune. And these assemblies are also in, interconnected with the cooperative. So economic or organizing isn't seen as something completely disconnected, collective economic organizing as something, it's not something completely disconnected from the overall political organizing that's taking place. This is a, I like this photo because it's uh, demonstrates the two uh, most important segments in Rojava's economy, agriculture and uh, oil, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, this one's, that one's from Raman. This is a, uh, this photo is from a woman's, sorry, back to it, a uh, woman's uh, shop, co cooperative shop uh, in Tirbesia, uh, sorry, Tirbespi. In uh, and its name was Nudam, meaning, uh, yeah, Lukiana uh, Nudam, yeah, Nudam shop, meaning new times, you know, like shop, new times shop, uh, sort of like a reference to the new times that's taking place in Rojava, all women, all like owned by women, ran by women, which is pretty inconceivable in the region up until recently, up until a decade ago. Uh, this is a photo from a chickens cooperative in Helseke. Uh, some of the cooperatives are, uh, yeah, th this, this one, for example, was maintained by several villages that are neighboring villages. I think 13 families from several villages came together to make these infrastructures with some aid from the co cooperative co you know, coordination center and made these facilities like hangar storage type of facilities where chicken are produced uh, for the internal market. Uh, this is a photo from Jumbar, the woman's commune in Dirbesia, uh, which houses 15 to 20 uh, families of women and their kids. And, uh, it's a commune with its own garden and farm and different economic activities with its own school, security hut. And this is from a husbandry, uh, husbandry co cooperative in Kobani. I just do this photo in there for fun. Uh, as you see, like a young one receiving milk from the mother who is also <laughs> Uh, receiving milk from a friend, uh, and yeah, this is a uh, from a woman's cooperative farm in uh, Rimalan again, uh, where there's both greenhouses like uh, to continue production during the winter months and uh, regular fields for some uh, growth of fruits and vegetables. Finally, to close off, uh, I would say uh, the collective economy, albeit it, the smallest segment of the three-tiered economy, uh, and albeit limited because of the war and embargo uh, that's been in place uh, in Russia for the past decade, which causes you know additional burdens and extra isolation uh, to the region. Uh, these, for these reasons, the 1% is not more and it cannot grow as uh, perhaps expected or desired, but it, it also serves the collective economy model, serves as a communal lifeboat where uh, people have this access, uh, this agency in the running of their lives, in the maintenance of the cooperatives, and uh, it's, it, 
yeah, it's people are not just dependent on the public and private sectors in a way. And uh, like I said, the war and embargo are key in terms of thinking about the economy, its composition, and its uh, status so far. Uh, and uh, to wrap up, I, although I would have liked to talk more about this, women are autonomously organized in, in all aspects of life, as well as economical organization. The women's autonomy in the economical sphere are meeting through uh, organizations like Aboriginal, uh, Congre, Star, which uh, uh, sort of like the umbrella uh, of the Kurdish women's movement uh, and women's communes like Jinwar. And uh, one note I would like to share as I wrap up. For example, uh, yeah, like women's autonomy, autonomous organizing, uh, sort of like the driving engine of this democratization of economic activities and political activities. Uh, and it was interesting to see that, for example, companies that are maintained, run by uh, the autonomous administration, uh, their percentage is higher in, in mixed gender spaces as, as opposed to women's only space. What do I mean by this? For example, uh, in a mixed gender co-op, there, there is more tendency for thinking or acting like, you know, like a company profit motivated, whereas a, a woman's uh, only equivalents like Aborigin, uh, like Congresta, have more, uh, more a emphasis and practice of this collective alternative cooperative uh, model of the economy. Uh, sorry again for the interruptions today, and thank you for your time. Um, thank you so much, Emre, for your super informative presentation. And now we'll have Megan talking about the Kurdish women's movement in Rojava. Go ahead, Megan. All right. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for putting this event together today, uh, to Anya for moderating and to Emra for his incredible presentation. So to focus on this, you know, what, in my opinion and the opinion of many who've been there, is truly one of the most remarkable aspects of the revolution, we're going to look a bit at the history of women in the Kurdish National Liberation Movement, how that impacted Rojava or North and East Syria, and then take a look at some of the innovations of the revolution in that aspect today. So I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Can everyone see that? Okay, so view, no, there we go. All right. So as some of you might know, um, but maybe you don't, in 1978, Kurds in Turkey, inspired by leftist national liberation movements and anti-fascist struggles around the world, established the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or the PKK. Now, at that time, there was just one prominent woman in the group when it was established, Sakina Johnses, who's pictured right here. Um, but many other women organizing and certainly women were present in the Kurdish and Turkish left wing spaces that the movement came out of. So as um, you know, the other speakers here have mentioned today, the PKK started out as a Marxist-Leninist national liberation movement seeking the creation of a Kurdish state. They believed that Kurdistan was a colony under Turkish colonialism um, and that that colonialism was supported by outside imperialist powers and that the founding of a socialist Kurdistan would lead to the freedom of the Kurdish people. And so women's liberation wasn't one of their priorities at the time, um, but as a socialist movement, they were conscious of the history of women in national liberation movements, anti-fascist struggles during World War II, and socialist struggles around the world. At the PKK's founding conference, um, in her memoirs, Sakina Johnson actually talks about, you know, bringing up the history of women's struggles in anti-fascist partisan campaigns against Nazi Germany, um, 
women in the Soviet Union, women fighting against imperialism in Vietnam. So the women who were present in the Kurdish movement at the very beginning were looking to the history of women in other socialist movements and other national liberation movements to sort of form a model for what they would be able to do. But at the same time, Kurdish society was very conservative. Um, one of the Turkish state's tactics in um, maintaining control of Kurdistan was the co-optation of tribal elites and other um, rather reactionary factions of Kurdish society in order to not only keep the Kurdish working classes and peasant classes down, but to also you know, maintain the rule of a very reactionary, very conservative, uh, very tribal social norms in that region. So it was difficult for women to really do anything outside of the home, let alone participate in politics. But with the PKK, they started to. And so in 1984, the group's armed struggle begins. And while Western media and a lot of mainstream sources acted like the participation of women in armed struggle against ISIS um, in North and East Syria was something new, that actually has a long historical legacy for Kurdish women. So here we can see um, some images of some of the first Kurdish women to obtain military training with the PKK and fight in its armed struggle. Here is a woman named Hanim Yavarkaya, who is said to be uh, the first woman in the PKK to um, take on a military command role, which she did just after the group's first attacks in August 1984. Here is Sultan Yavuz, another Kurdish woman and early guerrilla fighter in the PKK. Um, they were able to, you know, these women participating early on at that time, get military training um, in Lebanon, where the PKK trained alongside other, you know, revolutionary Middle Eastern groups um, and started to build some of those connections of international solidarity. Here is a early PKK poster showing two of the early women martyrs. And it says right there, um, long live the struggle in the revolutionary resistance of the women of Kurdistan. Um, and you see, you know, that sort of socialist iconography, but also that focus on revolutionary women. So as the conflict intensifies through the 1980s and the early 1990s, not only are more people joining the fight um, as, you know, the war expands, as the movement responds to, you know, the Turkish state's attacks, but Kurdish society is mobilizing as well. And for women who've lived, uh, you know, very restricted lives based on conservative social norms, the conflict, like conflicts everywhere, um, sort of opened up and, you know, at times forced them into new public roles. Women whose husbands and sons were imprisoned by the state uh, would become advocates for their imprisoned relatives and deal with oppression and discrimination as, for example, they were prevented from speaking, Tur speaking Kurdish with their imprisoned relatives and forced to speak Turkish as they dealt with a very unfair legal system, as they tried to get justice for their families. And in addition to this, um, because of, you know, both a need for as many people who could participate in the war effort as possible, and because of the freedom that it offered to women, uh, more women began to join the PKK as armed combatants. And what this meant is that they ran into the problem that women in all kinds of national liberation movements, socialist movements, conflicts, any sort of active, you know, dynamic changing military or political situation have encountered before, which is that the men who they were fighting alongside as comrades still had a lot of the same patriarchal attitudes that were common to their society. And so women in the movement from the bottom up started to organize for um, an end to that kind of, you know, double standard and for power and autonomy within the Kurdish movement itself. So the first autonomous Kurdish women's organization sort of affiliated with the movement, the YJWK or the Patriotic Kurdistan Women's Union was established in 1987. Um, this was affiliated with the Kurdish freedom movement, but it was under its political arm and it was not on the ground in Kurdistan. At this point in Europe was the place where, you know, Kurdish women in the diaspora were able to start uh, forming women's organizations within the national liberation movement. Um, and then in 1993, 
on the ground at um, in Kurdistan, you know, at one of the heaviest periods in the conflict, the early 1990s was when um, the Turkish government, you know, had raised thousands of Kurdish villages and displaced millions of people and fighting was very severe. So during that very intense period of war, there's the first attempt by women within the movement to establish autonomous all women's armed units. Um, women prior to that had been fighting with men and faced a lot of discrimination from some male fighters and commanders who would um, you know, assume that they were not capable of participating in armed actions or purposefully give them um, particularly risky tasks because they believed that they shouldn't be there. So as a counteract to that, they decided to try to organize their own units. They would eventually succeed in that, and that would become the Yeja Star, um, which would be, you know, the armed women's units that exist uh, today, and that, of course, would inspire the structure of the YPJ in northeast Syria. In 1995, they established the first autonomous women's organization in Kurdistan within the movement. In 1998, uh, they put forward the concept of the ideology of women's liberation, which starts to provide sort of a theoretical framework for uh, the role of women in the Kurdish revolution. They start to organize politically the Kurdistan Working Women's Party, which is meant to be the sort of parallel autonomous organization of women in the movement, is established in 1999. That goes through a few name changes in the next few years. And then obviously, as we know, it's uh, the late 1990s and the early 2000s when the Kurdish movement goes under a very intense period of restructuring um, after Ocalan's capture, and it moves to... Um, it moves away from a traditional Marxist-Leninist party model to a democratic confederalist model, um, which is, you know, the new theory that Ocalan came up with and the movement adopted. In 2005, the KCK, or which is the democratic confederalist structure of the Kurdish freedom movement that exists now, is established. And on the part of the women's movement, they established the High Women's Council, which I think is the um, community of women of Kurdistan these days, or the KJK. Um, and so the way that this all happened, and here's a picture of Ocalan, the leader of the PKK, with some women fighters in the 1990s, was in the time going through the 1990s leading up to his capture, what's important to note is that there was both a bottom-up effort by women to change the structures and the ideology of the movement and assert their interests as Kurdish women fighting for the freedom of Kurdistan and for the freedom of women. But also from the top down, Ocalan began to embrace these ideas and put them forward into his own theories. So you see a very fascinating and very informative pattern of practice and organizing by people involved in a struggle shifting theory, and then that theory informing further practice, and so on and so forth. So this wasn't something that was imposed on the Kurdish movement from the top down. Um, it was something that came about because of an interaction between, you know, bottom-up organizing and theory uh, that the movement's leadership came up with. And actually, um, after Ojalan was captured, there was some efforts by some people in the movement to try to um, marginalize the idea of women's freedom and women's liberation. Some people were arguing that because that had been something that Ocalan had put forward when he was in charge, that now that he wasn't there, you know, they didn't need to do it. Um, and they're arguing this from this position of, well, this must be this top down imposition, you know, how could women possibly do such a thing? But women in the movement actually responded to that very creatively with their own organizing, and they pushed for the concept of women's liberation and, you know, autonomous women's organizations to be something that would be a part of the Kurdish movement going forward. And they succeeded in that, um, and that's something that, you know, we can obviously see today. So what we ended up with was um, both theoretical and practical innovations that came out of this process. So that's there. Uh, if I am to be a freedom fighter, I cannot just ignore this. Women's revolution is a revolution within a revolution. Um, that's a quote from uh, one of Ocalan's books. Uh, it's a pamphlet on, you know, his views on women's liberation. It's free online. You can read it. And the importance of that 
is really the importance of one of the innovations of the democratic confederalist theory, which is putting the freedom of women at the center of their struggle for freedom as a whole. So this is where the Kurdish movement, you know, clearly breaks off from traditional socialist ideas. They argue that women are the first oppressed class in human history and that it was the oppression of women that enabled the oppression of nationalities, of workers, of any other group to have then been oppressed in society. And so they then go from that to say that in order to free society, you know, to liberate workers from capitalism, to liberate the Kurdish people and other oppressed peoples from uh, national oppression, religious oppression, colonial oppression, that the first thing that has to happen is that women have to be freed. And this is a new belief, you know, this is not something that you see in equivalent national liberation movements. You don't see it anywhere else in the Middle East. Um, so that's, sorry? That's something that makes them new. Um, and in practice, the way that this manifests is with the concept of autonomous women's organizations that came out of the practical struggles of women in the movement and was adapted to this theory. So in the Kurdish freedom movement today and in North and East Syria, this is true as well. For every political and military institution that there is, there is also a parallel autonomous women's institution. Sometimes it might be something different entirely. Sometimes it might be um, a meeting or a collective made up of all the women within that institution. But women have essentially a parallel organization for every political, military, social organization that there is. And that women's organization has decision-making power on issues that relate to women. So in North and East Syria, you see this a lot. Women have a level of political influence um, that they wouldn't have in a different type of system. One of the examples of this that people are probably most familiar with is the system of the YPJ within North and East Syria's military system. The YPJ, while it's part of the Syrian Democratic Forces and allied to the YPG and on the battlefield, they do fight together. Its command structure is completely separate and it's made up entirely of women. So no woman in the armed forces of North and East Syria as a member of the YPJ is actually under any male authority. It's an entirely all women command structure, but they're allied with the YPG, the SDF, which has all male and mixed gender components uh, within it. So one interesting thing is that it's very common for men to have a woman commander, you know, in a particular battle. There were women who led very important battles in Kobani and Raqqa, um, the campaigns, you know, resisting the Turkish occupation. But in the YPJ, a YPJ female fighter will technically never have a male commander who has any authority over her. Um, in the political structures of the Syrian Democratic Council, a similar position applies. Um, actually, when I was over there, I spent a lot of time with a woman from the Syrian Democratic Council who very proudly told me that um, if she is reassigned or moved to another position, only the women that she works for have that authority to reassign her or move her or promote her, that men can't do that. But the senior women in the Syrian Democratic Council have the ability to reassign men or women. Um, so there is really a level of autonomous political, military, and social power that women have through that system. Um, so moving to Rojava specifically, Syrian Kurdish women had joined the PKK and were politicized in society by its presence, even if they didn't. You know, they got the chance to see female fighters, to learn about the movement's theory, some of them to join and to go fight um, as part of the Kurdish revolution, you know, across the border in Turkey. But in the late 1990s, you have Syria and Turkey sort of um, improving their relations. This results in Ocalan being forced out of Syria and the Kurdish movement forced to go underground. But they kept organizing in secret and that social base that had been organized by the uh, Kurdish movement's presence there was really strong. So in 2003, the PYD is established. That was the main political party of the Rojava revolution. And then in 2005, an all women's organization called Yekatiya Star or the Star Union was established. 
Originally, this was intended to be the parallel autonomous women's organization to the PYD. They worked in secret. Um, a lot of these women benefited from sort of patriarchal attitudes about women's roles uh, because men who were, you know, expected to be organizing, the state uh, cracked down on them very harshly. But Syrian security forces would look at women and assume that they couldn't possibly be organizing politically. So they were able to sort of use those stereotypes to maintain and sustain their underground organizing. But they were very heavily targeted by the Syrian state, um, which had gone from tolerating the presence of the Kurdish movement to really cracking down on it. So they couldn't do much more other than recruit and organize underground until the Rojava revolution in 2012. And so to talk about that, I thought I'd show some pictures from my time in North and East Syria. So what we see in North and East Syria today is a diverse set of social, political, military institutions um, that have done a lot to organize a mass women's movement that's capable of participating in self-defense and self-governance. So in this picture here, I'm with the founders of the Kamishlo Malajin, or Women's House. So the women's houses are a unique institution in North and East Syria that serve to uh, fulfill some of the objectives that, you know, we talked about earlier of protecting women and organizing women in the society. And one thing that makes the revolution in North and East Syria unique is that, um, as I was told by the founders of the house in Kamishlo, women's houses are often the first institutions that the autonomous administration would establish when they became, um, when they took control of a city, whether that was from the government forces leaving or from liberating a city from ISIS. So they established the Kamishlo Women's House in 2011, before even the Syrian government had withdrawn from Kamishlo. Um, and the women's houses served two purposes. They were a center to organize and educate women, and they offered protection and mediation for, women's who, for women who were victims of domestic violence or other discrimination, violence, or oppression. So a woman who felt unsafe at home would be able to go to the women's house. Um, she would be protected, and the women's house could engage in community-based mediation to try to resolve the issue and if necessary, if it couldn't be resolved that way to refer the perpetrator to the courts. Um, one thing they told me is they try to resolve these problems without going to court because in their view, they don't want to simply have men refrain from patriarchal violence and discrimination because it's against the law. They want to change the perspective of the society so that kind of violence and discrimination simply isn't something that's done anymore. Um, and obviously when women do need protection and do need to be separated from a dangerous individual, um, they get the legal system involved, but they try to do a lot of this by themselves. Um, these women who are involved in the women's houses tend to be older women with ties to the community. Um, and so the respect that they have from their families, their friends, their neighbors, their communities allows them to do that mediation. And because they're close to the society, you know, they have a good idea of which women need help, what problems there are, and what kind of laws, policies, and institutions North and East Syria needs to really be able to protect and empower women. So the women's houses were involved in a lot of the legal and institutional um, changes that were made during the revolution to ensure um, women's safety, women's empowerment, and women's rights. Um, in 2014, when North and East Syria passed its women's laws, which corrected a lot of the inequalities and in things like personal status, marriage, divorce, um, and other matters like that that were present in Syrian law before the war, the women's houses actually helped write these laws and use their experience as women who had helped to protect women, you know, who'd been victims of violence, and who'd help to organize and educate women about their rights to help them, you know, gain rights and, you know, power in society. They were able to take those experiences and put that directly into the law. Um, so you had a really unique case of the people who were most affected and the people who were the most experienced in dealing with an issue, having a direct say in North and East Syria's laws on that issue. 
So North and East Syria now has, um, I believe they told me, more than 70 women's houses in all different cities um, that are in its control. And these institutions are playing a role in some of the ongoing legal and political processes now. Um, so in addition to helping the women who come to them for help and educating the women in their communities, they're also participating in the drafting of the region's new social contract and helping to change and reform laws um, in areas you know, that have been under the autonomous administration's control to continue to protect women. So these houses are centers for uh, the protection and defense of women's rights, but also for organizing women and advancing the role of women in society. So here is um, a photo from the offices of the Future Syria Party in Raqqa. Um, and the Future Syria Party was uh, led by Hevreen Khalaf, who was a Kurdish woman, um, you know, activist and politician who worked um, to defend not only women's rights, but also specifically um, for the idea of Netawa Demokratik, Democratic Nation, the coexistence of the peoples of North and East Syria. She was assassinated by Turkey-backed militiamen in October 2019 when Turkey invaded North and East Syria. And she's commemorated everywhere. Um, she was, and you know, the party that she worked for was a unique example of how these ideas that had begun, you know, in the Kurdish movement and, you know, were led by Kurdish women who'd been experienced in politics before the revolution began to expand to the political structures of all of North and East Syria as well. So this Kurdish led social movement for um, women's rights, women's empowerment, women's autonomy, spread to other political parties and other political institutions. The future Syria party wasn't just a Kurdish party, but its ideas about women's liberation um, were taken from the experiences of Kurdish women and women like Hevrin Khalaf, um, you know, use their experience and their knowledge to work with um, women across North and East Syria to educate them, to bring them into the political process, you saw a lot of pictures of her, commemorations of her in cities like Raqqa, Mendij, that are not Kurdish cities uh, because the local women saw her and the political projects that she and other women were involved in as something that was very relevant to them. So this became something across all of North and East Syria's political parties and political institutions. Um, and it wasn't just limited to those Kurdish communities. Kurdish women instead explicitly tried to, you know, share their ideas and their innovations with other women. So again, looking at both the political and social aspects of the issue, here I am in Kobani with the local branch of Congress Star, which is the autonomous women's movement um, that's sort of like the umbrella organization for all women's movements in North and East Syria. They had been organizing uh, as Congress Star since before the war, and they talked a lot about how, you know, the revolution allowed them to come out into the open and to do all of their work, which similar to the women's houses ranges from, you know, literacy classes for women who were never educated to awareness about, you know, health and other like social and, um, you know, issues that people might not be educated about and that are neglected uh, during the conflict, health issues, environmental issues, things like that, to organizing women to participate in politics. Um, so that was there. Um, you see when you go to these autonomous women's institutions that they're very active, that they're, you know, full of women from different backgrounds, women at different stages in life, younger women, older women, married women with children, you know, women who've chosen not to go down that path. Um, sometimes you see multiple women from the same family who are all involved politically in some way, um, which is, you know, very admirable, uh, very, very impressive to see. Um, so there's really a sense that this is a mass movement that's involved in every area of politics and society, and that these autonomous women's organizations aren't just for show, uh, they really have power. Here uh, to talk about the military side um, is a picture with Melrose Ahmed, who's the commander of the YPJ. Um, she was there when the YPJ was established as an autonomous women's military force and, you know, talked about 
how they fought in not just, you know, every major battle against ISIS and battle against Turkey um, when Turkey invaded North and East Syria, but how the YPJ also saw part of their struggle as changing society's attitudes about women. One thing that was true in North and East Syria um, and was true, you know, in the history of the Kurdish movement before it was that the presence of women on the front lines in armed forces was integral to changing how society saw women in other roles. Um, you know, she told me and other women I spoke to in military institutions told me that when communities that were otherwise very traditional and very um, limited in their ideas of what women could do, saw that women could organize on the front lines to fight a group like ISIS, to liberate towns, to keep people safe, that they then were much more accepting of women taking on leadership roles in other areas. So the military aspect of the revolution and the political and social aspects of the revolution very much reinforce each other. Um, a lot of times Western coverage of this issue tries to act like it's only a military issue, um, but it really is a mass movement with both a military and uh, political and social dimension. And the military leaders are you know, very open about talking about how their role of defending society from these existential threats from groups like ISIS and you know, authoritarian regimes like Turkey also helps the society you know, and women in the society in particular defend themselves and organize themselves against social problems. And then um, I'll leave it with this last picture here. This revolution is not something that stayed in the Kurdish regions. As um, North and East Syria expanded to include Arab majority cities like Manbij, which is this picture here, um, and like Raqqa, which was you know, taken over by ISIS and used as its capital for years until it was liberated by the YPG and the SDF, women in these cities, when their cities were liberated, were very enthusiastic to join the women's institutions, um, you know, that had been pioneered by the Kurdish movement. And the women's revolution in North and East Syria today, you know, and I say North and East Syria specifically, not just Rojava, because it is all of North and East Syria. It's not something that only women from one ethnic group or one social background take part in. Women from all ethnic groups in North and East Syria are very active. This is at a Malajin or women's house in the city of Menbij. All of these women are Arab. They're not Kurdish. They're from Menbij. They lived under ISIS, you know, and when the city was liberated, they decided they wanted to work in these autonomous women's institutions to protect women's rights. Um, you know, I remember I was, you know, as a foreign researcher, sort of being careful in the politics that I discussed with people when I first met them. But the conversation that I had my entire time in North and East Syria, um, where you know, the Kurdish movement's political theory and Ocalan's ideas were brought up the first, was actually my conversation here at the women's house, where one of the women said to me, look, you know, if it weren't for his ideas and his theories, none of us would be here. You know, we're here implementing those ideas you know, and these ideas that came from this revolutionary movement and they don't see them, nor does the Kurdish movement see them, as ideas that belong to Kurds only. They believe that they have a universal theoretical framework and practical blueprint for liberating all women everywhere. Um, when I met with an autonomous women's organization in Raqqa, one of the women there said to me that they believe that all Syrian women and all women in the Middle East have the same problems. And so they want to take what they're doing in the Northeast and make it a solution for all women in Syria, all women in the Middle East, and all oppressed women everywhere. Um, and I don't want to go on too long, but I'll leave it with that. Um, it's a very ambitious revolution. They've done a lot. They know they have a long way to go. And when you're on the ground talking to them, you really do get the sense that they will get there. Thank you so much, Megan, for such a rich report from the ground. It's uh, really great to learn about your experiences and observations there. Um, of course, there is so much to talk about um, the Rojava Revolution, and we've only touched on two aspects, really, the cooperative economy and women's emancipation. We have barely talked about other aspects um, of their vision and practice, such as direct democracy, 
social ecology, ethnic and religious pluralism as an alternative to nation state. But, uh, you know, let's get the conversation going and uh, let's see what folks are interested to talk more about. So uh, if you have any questions, right, Michael's writing in the chat. You can uh, write stack in chat, or you can also raise your hand um, digitally through the, but, um, through the hand raise tool at the bottom of your screen. So let's see if anyone has any questions right away, or if people need some time to digest so much information. Because um, I can start us off with one question. Um, I guess I, it's uh, for both of you, Megan and Emre. Um, both of you mentioned the various challenges that the movement in Rojava is currently facing and that prevents them from uh, implementing their revolutionary vision um, to the extent that they want to. So I wonder, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what are, what are the major challenges that they're facing? Would you like to go, Megan? Um, up to you. You can go, I can go. All right, I mean, I would say um, in the spirit of it being International Workers' Day and us thinking about, you know, international solidarity, anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism, one of the major challenges that they're facing now in North and East Syria is an existential threat from Turkey, which is a far-right authoritarian state under the government of Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the AKP. Um, and which is also a NATO member for 70 years that was a frontline state in the United States and the Western Bloc's Cold War strategy. And what that's meant, you know, domestically for Turkey, we could have a whole other event on that. Um, May Day in Turkey is actually the anniversary of, you know, an attack on workers who were demonstrating in Istanbul where many people were killed. Um, there were links, you know, to um, to NATO and to other, you know, Western um, intelligence and security forces, you know, by the, um, you know, entities in the Turkish state that carried out that kind of repression. So the history of how Turkey became, you know, a very authoritarian far right regime is very tied up with the support that Turkey got from the United States, from Europe, from NATO, from the West. And so the existential threat that North and East Syria faces from Turkey, you know, because Turkey sees any kind of Kurdish autonomy as a threat, um, and particularly any kind of left-wing, progressive, pluralist, democratic politics as a threat as well. And because North and East Syria, you know, contains the autonomy of the Kurds of Syria, of Rojava, and is a very universalist um, you know, democratic pluralist project that threatens um, Turkey's interests in that regard as well. The Turkish government has been very hostile to them. So I think that understanding the threat from Turkey, um, the conditions in the areas Turkey has already occupied, um, and understanding what we can do as people in Western countries to demand things like, for example, an end to arms sales and security assistance to Turkey an end to the criminalization of the Kurdish movement um, and, you know, to taking steps that would, instead of facilitating authoritarianism and militarism there, that would support peace and democracy and the struggles of people on the ground. Um, I think we very much should be thinking about that and keeping that in mind uh, because this project is limited in having to turn all of its resources to surviving attacks from the second largest army in NATO. Um, you know, supported by the international community. So I'd say that's one issue. Mm. And before we hand it to Emre, there is a question that's basically a follow-up question on which, what you just explained. Um, I was under the impression that the Turkish army had occupied northeast Syria and that much of the area is under Turkish control. Is this not true? And you already mentioned that it is uh, the case. To what extent has Turkey been able to crush or deter the democratic revolutionary movement? So perhaps, uh, Megan, since you were there just last year um, after Turkey occupied uh, a chunk of the territory, perhaps you can say a couple of words uh, what mm -hmm. the effect has been for the revolutionary movement. So yeah, Turkey now controls uh, the northwestern Syrian region of Afrin and the cities of Rasaline and Talabyad in northeastern Syria. 
Those invasions and occupations obviously, you know, hurt the revolutionary movement by displacing the entire populations of those regions. You know, those areas that are under Turkish occupation are no longer governed by a progressive, feminist, pluralist, multi-ethnic, multi-religious government like they were under the autonomous administration. Turkey and its proxy forces govern those areas um, essentially under a very lawless form of militia rule. Um, the people are oppressed. The armed groups that Turkey supports have displaced the local populations. They've committed atrocities against Kurds and other minorities, including Yazidis, Assyrians, Armenians. They have stolen property and homes. Uh, they've extracted all of the resources that they can from those regions while forcing their populations to flee. So there's been a definite setback and a real humanitarian tragedy in the areas that Turkey has occupied, but it has not defeated the project and it has not defeated the people. The people of North and East Syria are committed to continuing to stand up for their ideas and fight for their freedom, even though they know that they could be attacked at any time. And even though the invasions and occupations of their territory that Turkey has carried out have led to, you know, a very bad humanitarian situation, have harmed the region economically and have made the region less safe and less secure as they now have to share a border with these hostile occupied zones. So it's been a challenge. It's been a threat. It's been a very serious loss. Um, but the remaining parts of North and East Syria that are still under autonomous administration control, which is most of it, the people there are still very committed to what they're doing. Um, now, I think, um, Emre, maybe you could speak more to the economic aspects of the occupation, because uh, I know that that's a huge part of it, or anything else you'd like to say uh, to either of those answers. Absolutely. Before uh, I'll go in the same order, and you, uh, Megan did a uh, second Megan's response to both questions hit the critical parts, just to uh, add a point to the first question about the challenges. Turkey is the greatest challenge, the most aggressive sort of neighbor. Uh, and Megan touched upon this too, the, this international complicity, this international previous status quo. I want to highlight that a little bit more. Uh, another great challenge is you know, Rojava Revolution was able to flourish once the Arab Spring began, and there was some sort of vacuum of power uh, over the past 10 years. As we get closer and closer to the end of the Civil War, the possibility of this anti-Kurdish coalition is com not completely out of the picture. Turkey, the nation states of Turkey, uh, Syria, Iran, and Iraq, collaborated actively for decades, meeting in the different capitals they have with Western encouragement and participation uh, to continue the set previous status quo, which was the occupation of Kurdistan. And I think with the last past 10 years, we saw sort of like biggest shake of this coalition, biggest threat to this coalition, but I don't think it's completely... Uh, out of the picture is a threat, and hopefully the Syrian civil war will not end in the in the way that they would like to see. And economic sizes, yeah, the war and embargo uh, have been the sort of biggest difficulties. I mean, uh, every time you the conversation when. Okay, let me answer like this. In the Kurdish movement, there's this sort of practice of uh, criticism and self-criticism. You have this in Tekmil meetings, in specific Tekmil meetings, which are done to empower the community as a whole. Uh, but it's like lighter versions are done in everyday conversations too. And somehow... Uh, most of the conversations end up coming to the war and embargo. Like, uh, I went to a soap making company and we were talking about the chemicals, uh, possible potential chemical outputs, right? Despite the fact that they use lots of organic materials as much as they can, uh, there are still in the process, in their process of operation, uh, not like. Uh, 
things that are not completely environmentally friendly. And when we talk about the alternatives, they say, how can we get, how can we access? When we talk about the expansion of, uh, you know, green energy, when we talk about uh, the expansion of uh, certain bakery cooperatives, you know, there's embargo, we're lacking machinery. Uh, so it's like in different aspects of economic organizing, uh, this theme of access, limited, limited access, comes up a lot. And like I mentioned before, there's the private and public sectors. Uh, and private sector, there are a few of these merchants that are able to break this uh, embargo and isolation because of their connections to the neighboring powers, like a merchant in Rojava who may have close ties to Barzani, may end up working with autonomous administration and the, you know, uh, Southern, you know, Bashur's uh, administration, the Northern Iraqi administration. So, like, at very few times, this embargo uh, was able to, like, people were able to go around it, but in this time, there's this merchants racking up uh, extreme profits and taking advantage of the embargo and the isolation the region faces. There was, like, an example of lemon, for example. The summer I was there, they had, like, a short lemon shortage, and... You know, they were complaining about this, how this merchant that was able to get lemon, I think, was it either from Bashur or from the Assad-controlled areas, because of their political connections with both sides, had jacked up lemon prices so much that, you know, the administration was trying to find alternatives or find a way to compensate. But, yeah, people, like some monopolistic merchants, are taking advantage of this war and embargo situation as well. Sorry for keeping this so no, thank you so much for answering. Uh, we have Elizabeth next. Elizabeth? Hi, yeah, I uh, was, thank you. I was just uh, interested a bit in uh, the description of the women's situation there. And I'm wondering in what ways has it or hasn't it affected the actual structure of the family, the legal definitions, the way the family is treated legally, um, any traditional practices around the family, like, say, patriarchal naming practices? Or has it just been a case where the nuclear family has continued, but women are less subject to domestic violence in the home, for example? I mean, has there been any kind of structural change of the nuclear family, patriarchal nuclear family situation, or is it just that women's situation in that structure has improved somewhat? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think that we have to remember that the situation that they were starting with was one where under Syrian law, um, all matters related to marriage, divorce, inheritance, the status of children and issues related to the family were religious matters governed by the religious community uh, that the people who you know were registered in that community were a part of. So you know, the, the Syrian government um, and a lot of its uh, propaganda and outward leaning um, discourse tried to frame itself as very secular. There were very conservative, very religious based, very tribal based um, attitudes and practices that were enshrined in law. And when North and East Syria had their revolution and the autonomous administration, you know, came to power, the first thing they did was abolish those inequalities. So they made inheritance equal. Um, they made marriage and divorce civil matters rather than religious matters. They raised the aids of marriage to 18 uh, to outlaw child marriages. They made it so that, you know, in the event of a divorce, uh, women were able to have preferential custody of their children. Uh, you know, under previous law, men would be left with the children, you know, regardless of whether that was a safe situation for them or not, um, you know, even in abuse cases. They made a lot of reforms to laws that had given women a very unequal status. Um, and while it's not perfect, and certainly it's, you know, would be impossible in any society to erase thousands of years of patriarchy and the oppression of women in 10 years of social change, They've done a lot to give women a higher status, more protections. 
and not only legal equality, but means by which they can enforce that equality, that they, you know, have places they can go to and people who will help them if they face violence or they are discriminated against. Um, one thing you also see is a lot of women choosing to join various political or military structures of the revolutionary movement, and in doing so, choosing not to marry or to have children, which, you know, traditionally in any kind of conservative religious society, sort of the only path for a woman is, you know, to be a mother and a wife and to stay home and, you know, take care of those needs. And while North and East Syria has done a lot to, you know, protect women and give them more equality and, you know, control and power in the family, it's also provided life paths and socially prestigious life paths for women who would choose not to live that life. Um, so, you know, a lot of the women that I spoke to um, had decided, you know, that they wanted to focus on politics. Um, in the YPJ, as long as a woman is serving in the YPJ, you know, she can't get married or have relationships. Obviously, if she was married before, that marriage remains valid. And, you know, when she leaves, you know, and has decided she's done with military service, she could get married afterwards. Um, but some women, you know, join the YPJ or the civil structures because they want to focus on politics only or, you know, defending their people only and don't want to um, have a traditional relationship and a traditional family life. So there is uh, still a lot of, you know, there's still a prevalence of more traditional religious conservative attitudes, um, but there are many more protections for women in place and, you know, guarantees of equality and, you know, protection and um, having, you know, recourse legally if a woman's rights are violated or her children's rights are violated. And there are lots of new paths that a woman can take if she wants to participate in her society, defend her community, work in politics, and to do so, you know, without uh, choosing to marry or have a family or live a more traditional life. Um, and you even see women who, you know, have many children, um, like who've lived very traditional lives before the war, who now during the conflict are also playing a bigger role in politics and, you know, in uh, community activity and organizing as well. Um, one thing I noticed at a lot of the um, government institutions that I would visit would be that many would have on-site uh, daycare for kids. Um, and you'd even see women who'd brought their children with them, you know, who might have their kid with them in the meeting. And that was something that was considered acceptable. For example, you know, they weren't punishing women for doing that. So they're accommodating women with families, you know, who want to participate as well. Um, honestly, I'm excited to see, you know, if the revolution that lasts that long, all those little kids who are growing up seeing, you know, all the women they know, as politicians and fighters and social activists and in all those roles, you know, I think they will have a really fascinating new view of society because they'll never have known anything different. Thank you so much. We have a few questions now. Um, Alana is next and then Dave and then Tair. And uh, I hope I'm pronouncing more or less correctly. Alana, go ahead. Yes. Uh, maybe, maybe this is more of a comment than a question, but it seems to me uh, that after the end of, I guess it's the end of 2019 in the Trump administration uh, when they did that military pullout, that there's been a virtual media, at least in the Western media, blackout of what's happened after after that moment in, in uh, with the Kurds. And it's really disturbing because I'm listening to you because I'm curious, mostly because I don't know what's going on in in, uh, uh, in Rojava or with the Kurds right now. I don't know where they are between the Turkish oppression and Syrian civil war and, and whether, you know, <clears throat> and maybe this is now going to completely be blacked out with what's happening in Ukraine as, you know, American mainstream politics or, you know, are more concerned have putting all their energy and resources and the media in, into that horrible conflict. And I, I'm just surprised. Do you, do you see that real sort of absence of, uh, of, uh, media investigations or coverage of, and why is that, you know? 
or maybe that's not a not can't be answered. Maybe it's just an observation on my part. Emre or Megan, anyone wants to address this? I was actually just writing up some <laughs> resources where you can get news on Russia developments on Russia in English. The few ones that came to the top of my head were the ones I'm posting on the chat box right now. North Press, on FA English, on High English. Uh, uh, what else? What else? There's, there's Rojava Information Center, which is not RIC website, which is not like updated daily, but they have very informative reports once every few months. So more midterm follow-ups uh, can be done there. Uh, but I agree, since the occupation of Serekanie, Rojava has been less in the international sort of like means in media. I guess there are some diplomatic calculations that go into that as well. Megan, do you have anything to add? Um, nope, those are all really great sources. Um, I'd highly recommend them. Definitely uh, for people looking to not only understand what's going on, but how you can get involved. Uh, keeping up to date with what ECR is doing is great because um, they do lots of events, um, you know, all kinds of um, opportunities to learn more about the situation and then uh, to do something about it and specifically to take actions that we in the United States can take to um, challenge and end, hopefully, our government's complicity in what Turkey's doing in Kurdistan. Thank you both. Uh, Dave is next. Yeah, uh, Megan, you mentioned that uh, uh, the prohibition on relationships in the YPJ, um, I don't know if that extends to taking up other uh, work in the political sphere and also in the mixed military force, does that uh, apply to women and men over there as well? So my understanding is that is only in North and East Syria. It is a prohibition that is only in the YPJ. Um, in the PKK, like the Armed Kurdish Liberation Movement Fighting Against the Government of Turkey, that applies to everyone in all of their military structures. In North and East Syria, I believe it's just the YPJ, um, you know, both to give women, um, you know, a protection um, from, you know, communities and families that might try to force them into a marriage or a relationship that they don't want to be in and allow them to have that alternative path. Um, and simply because of the practical realities of um, a frontline war where, you know, it's not um, always the best scenario for a person to have to, you know, worry about a family at home. Um, because North and East Syria is in a total war scenario and they have had to have a mass mobilization of their entire society, in the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, for I believe men and women in the SDF overall, there's no rules on that. Um, and there's no prohibition uh, for people who were already married and who did already have children. You know, that doesn't negate the existing legal or familial uh, situation that they had. Um, so that, you know, it's something that there's a variety of practical and ideological reasons for it. Um, and it comes out of the Kurdish freedom movement's rules and policies before North and East Syria. Thank you. Um, Thank you. There is a related question in the chat from Tahir. Um, have there have there been parallel changes in their role in the roles of men? For example, an acceptance of men who want to stay at home and raise children or other roles traditionally assigned to women? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know so much about in the social sphere. Um, I know that the autonomous administration and particularly the women's organizations do a lot of political education uh, for men as well as for women um, and that you do see talking to men and women in the SDF, the YPG, YPJ, the administration and its political institutions that the commitment to gender equality and women's liberation isn't something 
that's only brought up by women or only valued by women. Um, I did speak to a lot of men who believed that one of the most important achievements of the revolution was the equality and the advancement of women and who were able to talk about how, for example, their attitudes had changed because of the revolution. You know, that previously they might have believed that women weren't as good at some things or women couldn't do some things, but that after working with women and seeing what women had accomplished, that they had changed their minds um, and that they wanted to, you know, make sure that equality was the value that was passed down, that they didn't want to go back to, um, you know, the way that men had previously thought. Um, so you do see a change. It is really um, something remarkable to see how much the women's movement isn't just seen as an achievement of women, but as an achievement of the revolution, which I think a lot of times when we look at women's struggles or you know the struggles of any group that might be oppressed in a society, it's easy to just talk about them as though they're only the issue of that one group that's affected. But in North and East Syria, you get a real sense that any victory for any oppressed group in the society is a victory of the revolution that's shared by everyone. Um, so I do think that slowly but steadily over time, we're seeing new attitudes. Um, I don't know how that'll necessarily play out in the social sphere, um, but you do see um, a real commitment to change and a new way of, you know, working together among men and women in the political and military spheres. I wonder if you, um, if you, Emre, had similar observations, having visited and done research there as a man. Uh, as a man, I too was uh, able to like observe and experience this point about, you know, um, transformation among men, both generational, but I feel different age groups. Uh, uh, I'd like to share a couple sort of anecdotal examples to, you know, I guess illustrate a couple points. There was this, uh, in other parts of the world where I'm from, uh, where I've been, it's really rare, especially in Baku, the Turkish occupied Kurdistan, but in Western Turkey too, and different countries. It's hard to see uh, women stand tall, like strong in public spheres and interactions, as much as I witnessed in Rojava. And this, you know, this is mainly this is due to women's struggles and autonomy, uh, which has began to transform life for men as well. Uh, this, I don't, I, you know, trying to be self-critical, I don't mean to romanticize this. There is also patriarchal dynamics and resistance too among some men. Uh, I've heard when talking to men, especially when we're talking about women's autonomy, people sometimes thinking or asking questions, is this isolationist, you know, is this, divisive, separatist types of discussions, uh, which reminded me of, you know, previous responses in politics or organizing spheres that we're familiar with. But these do not make up, uh, these are not strong to make up, like to dominate public discussion, you know, and uh, people are clear, most when I speak to are clear about women's autonomy and its relation to general organizing, how, you know, the point uh, Megan was making before, how the veto power is one way, you know, women's autonomous organizations have usually veto power over the decisions of their mixed gender equivalents and not vice versa. And yeah, most men are aware of these new, like, structural changes and, you know, like every transformation, there is some backlash resistance, but it's not as strong as it is in some other parts of the world. One, um, just to add in one last story uh, that sort of shows, you know, some of the differences. I, you know, in talking to people over there, I heard that when the YPG, YPJ, SDF, you know, first started to interact a lot with a lot of, you know, foreign diplomats and foreign armed forces as part of the campaign against ISIS, um, 
they would remark very often on how few women were in those foreign delegations, you know, and they would even say this to some of the women uh, visiting from these foreign countries, like, why aren't there more of you? You know, why are you the only one? They were surprised at sort of the, you know, lack of women in these countries that see themselves as advanced Western democracies and all of that. Um, you know, I've even heard that some of these senior leaders of the political and military institutions of North and East Syria, when dealing with foreign militaries and foreign governments, sometimes representatives of these foreign militaries and foreign governments would go to male and female leaders in North and East Syria and say, oh, you know, I can't be working with this woman. Surely she's not the person who's in charge of this initiative or this campaign or that. And the highest ranking men and women in North and East Syria would have to tell these Westerners, no, no, that is who you're working with. Um, she's in charge of this. That's how our system works. You know, it's not an unusual thing for us for a woman to be in charge of a very serious military or political issue. Um, so they were at a level where at least among the very experienced, you know, very highly involved political and military leadership, um, you know, they were correcting and educating the Western governments who were in North and East Syria um, as part of the campaign against ISIS. Um, and I think that, you know, that shows a lot, like, it's easy to talk about what they're doing in North and East Syria as like, oh, well, it's an advancement for that region. Um, and it obviously is, but it's an advancement for the world. You know, there are areas in which they have surpassed um, all kinds of societies under all kinds of governments in all kinds of religious and political and historical contexts. So, and that's played out, you know, in their interactions with other countries. Thank you so much for sharing your fascinating examples. We have Debbie next. Thanks so much for waiting patiently for your turn, Debbie. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for such a wonderful presentation and you know, really excellent opportunity. Very educational. I had a, a kind of a part, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but obviously everybody's invited to, to speak about it. What I wanted to do was just follow up on one of the things that was said it was interesting to me the question about media coverage and why there's not more like Western media coverage and also kind of connecting that with the whole question of internationalism, which you guys have spoken so eloquently about. And what, what I wanted to say is, you know, I think that, and I'm a journalist, of course, you know, for, for decades, and I think that, you know, there really has been a shameful lack of media coverage in the last couple of years, as one of the, uh, one of the uh, audience participants mentioned. Um, and that, you know, there's many reasons for that. But, and, and you know, it's certainly right now with what's going on in Ukraine, you see a really stark example of the hypocrisy because there are many, many war reporters in Ukraine right now who are covering what Russia's doing there. And there were far too few covering what Russia was doing in Syria in support of Assad and also, you know, the whole subsequent Turkish invasion and the, con and the whole conflict there. And, but what I wanted to connect that with is, you know, something that I think is also really important, which is that, especially on today, May Day, you know, it's really all about solidarity. And yet there's such a often sort of a, a shocking lack of solidarity in many ways, comparatively speaking, by the American left when it comes to the Kurdish liberation movement. And, you know, we should really all be very natural allies because, because look at what they're doing. I mean, anybody who cares about feminism, about equal rights, about social justice, about economic equality should really be on board. And yet, sometimes it almost seems as if the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is sort of the least interested in this. And just to like an example, you know, Jamal Bowman from the Bronx, the progressive socialist from the Bronx, has really um, taken several thousands of dollars uh, from the Turkish American National Steering Committee, which is basically a front for the Turkish dictator Erdogan. 
and has and then just a few months ago it was Jamal Bowman who coincidentally I don't know but he voted against keeping American troops in Syria now I understand you know why people think oh you know we're all past Pacifists and we want to keep, you know, get American troops out of everywhere. But the truth is that a real solidarity position is one in which we say, hey, if there's a few hundred, a few hundred troops in Syria that keeps a true imperialist power now, Turkey, from destroying one of the most important political projects of the last, you know, 50 years, you could argue almost, aside from what the Zapatistas are doing, that it's the most important thing since the Spanish Revolution, you know, in 1936, then, you know, you just have to wonder, why is he accepting these thousands of dollars? And what can we do? I guess this is just a sort of a question, but also in a way a challenge to everybody who's obviously cares about Rojava, who's here today, to talk to your friends who are progressives, to reach out to your representatives, because what the question is sort of what can we do to help really support this Kurdish project? And, you know, and, and there's lots of different answers to that. I mean, one of the things that when I was in Rojava, the Kurds told me is they said, start doing this kind of democratic confederalism in your own towns, you know, organize on the local level, have assemblies, participate in what we would call assembly democracy, you know, and, and sort of bring these ideas to life outside of Rojava because they really do see their revolution as an internationalist revolution. But the other thing is I think we really need to hold progressives accountable. You know, people who are voting for somebody like Jamal Bowman from New York, you know, he needs to hear from people. And the more we do, I think that will also ultimately help increase media coverage in, in the West. And, and that includes things like writing letters to the editor of, pap of papers or reaching out to, you know, reporters for those who might have contact. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And obviously anybody can comment, but I, I just thought it was kind of related to some of the other questions that were asked today. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, I'll use this opportunity to do some advertising for Emergency Committee for Rojava, because if anyone wants to take some action and explore opportunities for you know, solidarity work, um, uh, just visit our website uh, and get in touch with us. Uh, we do regular phone banks, um, contacting um, our Congress people and um, educational events, reading groups, etc. So. And now, Megan and Emre, do you want to address Debbie's point or should we move on to another question that we have in the chat? Okay. Yeah, Megan, did you want to say something? No, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, to that point about the American left, I think the problem that we have is that people simply aren't aware of the history and the true nature and extent of the U.S. involvement in this conflict. Because when we look at U.S. involvement in the Kurdish conflict and, you know, the Kurdish freedom struggle, what we see is what the U.S. has primarily done is supported these regimes that have led to the Kurds being in the situation that they are in and to many other oppressed peoples in the region being in the situation that they're in in the first place. You know, we talked a bit about Turkey's role in NATO and the U.S. role in supporting the most nationalist and militarist elements of the state in Turkey as they cracked down on Kurds, but also on workers, on women, on struggles for democracy and equality, you know, within Turkey across that country as well. And I think that getting a better historical sense of the role of the United States, um, you know, with Turkey, with NATO, but even in other regions, if we look at Iraq and South Kurdistan, for example, many people aren't aware, but when Saddam Hussein was engaging in his genocidal campaign against the Kurdish people in northern Iraq, um, the United States was supporting him and supporting the Iraqi government because at the time, the United States supported Iraq against Iran in that conflict. And the weapons and even some of the materials used um, and weapons used in the use of chemical weapons against the Kurdish people that was provided and facilitated in part by the United States. And then the United States, after the chemical attacks and, you know, the tragedy, the, you know, mass murder at Halabja, the U.S. went to the U.N. and, you know, tried to water down and block a condemnation to lay the blame on Iran. 
And then when you see, you know, the understanding of the U.S. and Iraq and the Kurdish issue and a look at the issue that only starts in 2003 with the invasion and the occupation, that's not the full picture because, well, why was there this dictator in the first place? This was a dictator and a far right authoritarian regime that was supported by the United States. So I think that getting a better picture of the situation in Kurdistan and how for the majority of the conflict and for the past hundred years that, uh, you know, Kurdistan has been a divided region under four very nationalist autocratic regimes the U.S. has been in some way or another on the side of those regimes. And we in the U.S. have the power to start to change that. Um, and, you know, like we were talking about, that starts with things like arms sales, with security assistance, um, with, you know, opposing the U.S. Uh, and Europe and NATO and the Western world's criminalization of the Kurdish resistance movement, you know, campaigning to get the PKK off the terror list, there are a lot of things we can do that are anti-war, that are anti-militarism, that are anti-interventionism to simply get these autocratic states and their conflicts and their repression out of the way to weaken them, to take away their U.S. backing. And then, you know, that I think will allow the peoples in the region to flourish and to be able to carry out their revolution without needing to make some of these compromises in the name of geopolitics. The reason that they have to make those geopolitical compromises in the first place and, you know, work with unsavory actors is because our government has been supporting the dictatorships that are trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. So we can and should understand that full history and campaign against that. I think that, you know, that's internationalism. That's what we can do. And I know that ECR has great campaigns against, for example, the um, proposed new sale of F-16s to Turkey. We all know what those F-16s will be used to do to target the people living on the ground, not just in Kurdistan and North and East Syria, but Yazidis and Sinjar uh, to people in, you know, in Northern Iraq, the diverse communities that live there. We don't want Turkey to have those weapons. Those will only be used to destabilize the region and hurt people. So campaigning against things like that are in line with other leftist and socialist and anti-imperialist and anti-militarist campaigns and goals. Um, you know, similar to, I know there have been efforts to stop arming awful regimes like Saudi Arabia for what they're doing in Yemen, to stop arming Israel for what they're doing in Palestine. Ending arms and aid to Turkey for what they're doing in Kurdistan fits right in line with that. Um, and a lot of these other campaigns uh, fit in line with other similar goals by left and progressive and anti-imperialist movements. So I think we just need to get better at explaining that history, making those connections, and then taking action. So that would be my comment on that. Thank you, Ma Ma Megan. This point about the uh, misperception of uh, you know, misperception on, on some leftist circles all about, you know, the role of the West and its complicity uh, historically with the authoritarian regimes that have been occupying Kurdistan. In addition to this, I want to add, I think there's also misperception in the same circle, in some of these circles, about the Kurdish movements or, you know, the autonomous administrations strategy as well. I think the third path is not uh, as well understood in the Western public as well as it may be in Rojava on the ground. People are very much aware of imperial politics, you know, the different sort of global political camps and people are very much aware of the extent of US imperialism, you know, uh, from the like top core co organizers of militias or councils, to, you know, people on the ground, cooperative workers. Most people are aware of these things, and the idea is not to simply uh, be content with a life under some sort of patronage, but the idea is to uh, bring, the revol like the, bring the framework of the revolution to fruition, to reality, and to do that any aid from anywhere in the world is met with open arms, you know, and Rajoa, the, like both the politicians and administrations, but the people realize that, you know, if this aid come, came from, you know, anywhere. So it's like 
none of the solidarity is refused. And in this case, it's not just the case. The situation is more that some parts of the world offer no solidarity, others offer little, and all are taken. But it's not Rojava with its administration and people like preferring one solidarity or other, other or playing some sort of yeah, bipartisan game. Thank you so much. We have one question left in the chat. Michael, how are we doing on time? Should we go with that question? We are not strict. Okay. If we go over a little bit or under, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So this is a very important event, and it's not that often that a group of people gets together like this and is setting up networking. So take what time is needed. Wonderful, thank you. So I'll read out the remaining question from Andrew. I had recently read that the United States was going to lift Caesar Act sanctions on the, on the regions of Syria that were not under the control of the Assad regime, namely the autonomous administration. Have either of you heard of whether this has been implemented and do you think it will have any meaningful effect on life in Northeast Syria? Should I begin? You're the economics expert, so <laughs> go first. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I remember reading some news recently, but I don't know if it's been implemented yet on the ground. I don't think so. And I remember when the, uh, you know, initially when the CISRA came, it had come with exemptions for the autonomous administration. Uh, and then there were some reshuffling, the Al Yoruba crossing that the administration had access to was closed and all the international aid coming into Rojava was rerouted through the uh, only crossing, I think, uh, yeah, Samalka, which is, or not Samalka, no, no, not Samalka, Rabia, which is controlled by the Syrian state into the country. So uh, that had made things more difficult. The reduction, like, yeah, international aid up until like three, four years ago was coming through two, uh, two gates and one of which under uh, autonomous administration control. But after, uh, I think, yeah, two years or three years ago, the... Uh, crossing that autonomous administration had access to was closed down, which deepened the isolation uh, of Roja, like Roja's economy. So the lifting of, the relifting of CISR Act again uh, would ease the uh, economic bur burden uh, on the ground, but yeah, still the, uh, Still, the embargo from neighboring countries usually continues despite the wavering of Caesar. So I don't think it would end the economic problems on the ground. Yeah, no, I um, also haven't heard anything about that having been implemented yet. My understanding is that the policy is still in progress and, you know, it's all being finalized. Um, when I was there, the economy and the impact of U.S. and international sanctions was actually one of the biggest issues that people brought up to me. Um, you know, people would talk about Turkey, they'd talk about ISIS, and then they'd talk about the economy. Because if people don't have the basic resources that they need to live, um, you know, you can't have any kind of revolution, much less, much less any kind of, you know, society or existence. Um, there needs to be a baseline standard of living and, you know, a baseline level of resources first. So that's something that's very important to the people there. Um, it's an issue that simply is not covered in Western media. Um, even those people who are sort of, you know, I almost want to say superficially pro-Kurdish, quote unquote, um, have had very little reflection or introspection on what sanctions have done to Syrian Kurds, to other peoples in North and East Syria, to their ability to maintain a basic standard of living and rebuild after the war. So it's not an issue that gets a lot of coverage, but 
what I heard from people there is that any kind of relief and lifting of sanctions obviously will help them. Um, my personal opinion is that there needs to be an end to all of these sanctions on Syria, as we know from other countries, you know, like Iraq, for example, they only hurt the people who are already the poorest and already the worst off, working people, displaced people, um, particularly women, particularly minorities, any other people who are already disadvantaged will be especially hurt by the economic deprivation that sanctions cause. So I think that when the sanctions exemption goes through, that will be an important step and that'll be very good for the people of North and East Syria. But I think as we look at not just discussing the current situation, but looking at the actions we can take to shape the future situation, campaigning for an end to serious sanctions as a whole and allowing you know, the Syrian people um, to be able to access the economic resources that they need to rebuild after a decade of war. Um, I think that that's a goal that we should all be talking about as well. Thank you. We have a logistical question uh, in regards to the recording. So as I know, Michael will post the recording on the Vimeo channel of the Marxist Education Project, correct? Oh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> If it's okay to be public, it'll be on the YouTube channel later, maybe a week from now. I don't do the technical work myself. There is a volunteer who edits the tapes, not taking any content out, but just the early chatter, whatever. But, and then mm -hmm. uh, combines it with the chat so that you get the tape and the chat, which has important resources people have typed in there. And I put in in the chat, to write to info at marksideproject.org to let me know that you want this stuff and I'll make sure it gets sent along. And we'll, we'll keep tally of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And we'll repost with your permission on our YouTube channel and I'll- uh, Whatever you want, yes. I'll paste, I'll paste the link to that as well. So are there any remaining questions or comments by anyone in the audience? Michael, yes? I don't even know how to put this question, but- and, and I know, I'm sure in some of the resources that were laid out that I could find something on this. But with the military, with making uh, women's militia or army units, there is an engagement with extreme violence at times. And there must be certain policies on how to treat prisoners, um, how, how to deal with the, the loss of life or the capturing of, of uh, your fellow combatants and to not extend the, that militarization into daily life. I, I assume there is a lot of cultural and individual preparation for people going into battle, both men and women. But what has been the, the uh, I, I'm sure there are like, uh, policy guidelines, but the the experience against some of these armed forces, the 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 movement has been up against has been against some of the most vicious anti women groups that we know of, and there must have been extreme violence done at certain times. Yet there must I I sense also there there must be a, a culture of not. Uh, eye for eye or the kind of retaliation, retaliatory measures that come up with other groups. And I've never talked to anyone about this, but I do think of what happens when really, I, I don't want to just say progressive, when liberatory forces get engaged with military, how do we not become that militarized self after the engagement is kind of my, my question. No, I, I don't know how to put it any clearer than I have, but that's it. Yeah, no, that um, it's certainly something that is part of the discussion and the uh, revolutionary effort there. North and East Syria, for example, does not have the death penalty. Um, they're working as hard as they can to have actual substantive trials uh, for, you know, ISIS members. 
one of you know the serious challenges that they do have is what to do with all of the ISIS and suspected ISIS prisoners. Um, there are issues in security um, and in you know having trials that aren't simply terrorism prosecutions, but that prosecute these individuals for you know the true atrocities that ISIS committed for crimes against humanity, for genocide, for war crimes. So they are working to establish a framework that respects basic international standards and brings justice for the victims and allows evidence of the atrocities that happened, you know, as was done, for example, after World War II, um, documenting what these groups did and what the peoples of the region survived is very important. Um, this is another area where the international powers that were very quick to intervene in Syria have done very little in terms of actually seeking justice for the people impacted by ISIS. I believe part of this is because, you know, especially when you get into the issues of foreign fighters and the roles of regional states, it would cast many Western and Middle Eastern governments in an unflattering light. Um, when you look at how so many people from foreign countries were allowed to join, um, how many of them were able to go back, how you know weapons were supplied to armed groups that differed only from groups like ISIS in name, not in ideology or tactics. So you know that is obviously a challenge that they have. Um, but the Kurdish movement has a long history of really working to be better than the people that it's fighting. Um, there's a very famous peace activist whose name is Yanis Vasilis. Um, he is of Greek origin, but um, you know, thought that he was Turkish, grew up in an assimilated, you know, Turkish family of uh, you know, ethnic Greeks who had been forcibly assimilated into Turkish ethnicity by the Turkish state. And in the 1990s, he joined the Turkish military specifically to fight Kurds. He wanted to fight the PKK. You know, he believed that as a Turk, his duty was to fight Kurds, to fight terrorism. And he goes to fight the PKK and he's wounded in battle and he's captured. And he's written a lot about this. I'll send a story to the chat. But while he, you know, was um, held by the PKK as a prisoner of war, both the fact that they treated him very well, you know, they didn't try to hurt him, they treated his injuries, they held him in accordance with international standards for prisoners of war. And then the fact that when his family went to the government for help, the government said to them, you know, we know you're not originally Turkish. We know that you're Greek. We can't help you. We'll simply say that you're Greek PKK members, you're Christians, you're infidels. We won't get your son back. And so that's how he found out about his Greek origins. You know, he changed his name. That's why he goes by a Greek name now. And he became a peace activist who worked, you know, for the rights of the Kurds, but also the Greeks, the Armenians, the Assyrians, you know, the Christian peoples of Anatolia and Mesopotamia who were, you know, massacred, persecuted, forced to assimilate. Um, so the fact that these groups, you know, have been able to treat their enemies so humanely that they realize that they may not have to be their enemies at all um, is something that I think is a real testament to the character of that movement. Um, and in Syria, too, I mean, even for, you know, obviously the ISIS members who committed serious crimes, you know, they will be held accountable but they're trying to rehabilitate and find community-based rehabilitation strategies for people who simply joined, you know, out of desperation, out of um, the fact that, you know, allegiances in their region were shifting, for people who they believe did not commit crimes and are unlikely to do so and who can be real members of society, they're trying to rehabilitate them. Um, you know, they have a belief that, it's better for people to change and understand why sectarianism and misogyny and violence and persecution are wrong than it is for them to simply only avoid doing those things because those things are illegal. Um, that's why their court system, for example, has a whole level of community-based mediation before a case has to go to the official legal system. Um, so they really do care about that. The Kurdish movement as a whole cares about that. It's the same reason that they're not narrow nationalists. You know, 
Just like they don't want to create a Kurdish state to replace the Turkish or Syrian states, they want a system that's based on equality and democracy and rights for everyone. They also want to, you know, not model themselves after other authoritarian or harmful practices in the region. And as with everything, they're not perfect and they're dealing with some very difficult problems. But, you know, the intent is there. Um, and some of those efforts, you know, have started to show some success and hopefully they'll show some success, more success in the future and they'll be able to, you know, stay on that path. Emre, do you have anything to add before we close? Mm, no, that was perfectly put. Thanks, Megan. Okay, I guess this is a good note for us to end. Once again, thank you so much, Michael, and the Marxist Education Project for organizing this. All the this. thanks is to you and, 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 and everyone who came today. It's uh, been a very great afternoon for, for myself and others who have been here, I'm sure. And we... Uh, because I do these often, uh, you know, I wish that, that there had been 10 full screens of people, but we did not have a high attrition rate today, which is always an indication of very good presentations and people who know how to put PowerPoint together. So <laughs> it was really a great day. So thank you. And everyone, follow these resources, get involved. And thank you very much.